Shri Tripura Rahasyam Mahatmya Khandam Aum Shri Ganesha Sharada Guru Bhyo Namaha Namaste. So last time we went over four conceptions of femininity, the anima, which were uh, classified by Carl Jung. And how do they apply to spiritual life is what we're going to look into this time. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to get an understanding of how our internal image of uh, womanhood, femininity, the, the feminine in general, gets projected out into the world. The anima and animus are subjective ideas. It, it's not like we're trying to classify other people into these four levels. Huh? It's not like we're trying to say, oh, that woman is like Eve, or that woman is like Helen of Troy, or that woman is like so many, so Sophia, or whatever. No. No, don't make that mistake. Yes, it's true that women also identify with these four classes or levels of femininity, and they model themselves after them, those archetypes. But that's a different story. <laughs> that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about one's own concept of femininity and how it evolves from an animalistic to the divine level. Okay? So these four classifications, Eve, Helen, Mary, and Sophia, are meant to give insight or shed light on our own views. Huh? How do we regard womanhood, femininity, in a broad sense? Huh? What is the archetype? The, you know, Jung talked about the uh, collective unconscious, which is a body of ideas and gestalts, again, to use that technical word, that are shared by all humanity. So these archetypes are part of that collective unconscious. They exist whether you're aware of them or not. And they influence your thinking, they influence your feelings especially on a subconscious level. They can be made conscious by simply by looking into it. And so that's what we're encouraging you to do to look into your conception of the feminine and how you identify with it or project it on others. Now, even men have a feminine side, okay? The, the soul, the being, the spiritual living entity, the jiva, huh, has both masculine and feminine energy. Because one can take a male body in one life, a female body in another life, uh, or even among different species. So in that way, we all possess a masculine and a feminine side. So how do we view these? Huh? How do we view, especially because the topic is Tripura Sundari, how do we view the divine feminine for many people, uh, men and even women, the divine feminine is a completely alien concept. It's like, what? <laughs> God is male, right? Well, that's the cultural stereotype in the West and even in much of the East. But the Chinese were always beyond it. Huh? They envision God as Tao, which is beyond dualities like sexual identities, gender, and things like that. <clears throat> but we have to start from where we are. Where we are is we're embedded in a male-dominant society, a society that's based on aggression, 
and bullying. So we have to, if we really want to understand this divine feminine, Tripura Sundari, we have to get beyond this limited concept and see the possibilities of something higher. So when we do that, we advance not only in our emotional life, in our spiritual life as well. So wouldn't you know it, there's a strong correlation between the archetype that one identifies with uh, for the anima and one's spiritual standing in the four darshans, darshanam, chatur darshanam, given by Shankaracharya. So we're going to go back to our good old chart. Here it is. You have on the left side the four darshanams, Dvaita Vada, Vishishta Dvaita Vada, Vivarta Vada, and Ajata Vada. And down at the bottom, the Pashu, the animalistic humans who have no yoga process, no real process of linking with God. We have added a column on the right. Take a look at it. The concept of the anima that correlates with these four darshans. Let's take a look at the Pashus, the animalistic humans. Well, of course, they're going to regard all women as just other animals huh? because one tends to project what one sees in oneself, huh? one's own self-identity. We tend to project on others. So an animalistic human being sees women in general as just being animals to be exploited, to be used. Huh? So we don't want to talk about that because that's nasty. But on the first level, even Dvaita Vada, dualistic religion, sees a huge gap between the concept of masculinity and femininity. And there is also a strong tendency for them to view women merely as like uh, cattle. <laughs> You know, keep them pregnant and barefoot, <laughs> isn't it? And that men are somehow more advanced or more exalted. You know, I don't get this because, as I said, the jiva, the living entity, can take either male or female bodies. So the same jiva could be either in a male or female body. Right? The same level of spiritual advancement, the same consciousness... So how do we get that men are more advanced than women? This is a cultural prejudice. This is a bias. Uh -huh. It's a, a conceptual bias. Because there is a mistake which we call neo-advaita, which is that spiritual uh, realization is only a concept. It's only an idea in the mind. So if you get the idea and you're realized, no, no problem. No, that's not true. Spiritual realization is more than a concept. It's more than an idea. It's more than an intellectual understanding. It means a change in consciousness. Without that change in consciousness, which can only come by practice, there's no actual realization. One doesn't lose the tendency to take birth and suffer in this material world. Because one can only understand living in a body. And the body is always either male or female. I'm going to leave out, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to leave out the discussion of intersex and all of this. Where it makes things really complicated. And unless you're a doctor, you probably wouldn't understand it anyway. So... Uh, people in dualistic religion have a prejudice against women and for men. They tend to see men as being more advanced and women as being less advanced. Okay, But actually, according to spiritual philosophy, this is nonsense. You get a large number of relatively low-level people, and then there's always a few exceptional people who stand out higher. Take a look at the population. 
column in the chart. The Dwaita Vada population is maybe less than 10% of the total, whereas the Pashus, the animalistic people, are more than 90%. And the next level, the Vishishta Dwaita people, who are in Bhakti Yoga, spontaneous Bhakti, authentic Bhakti, they are less than 1%. But they're the ones who can conceive of women as the uh, romantic heroine, as a real individual, uh, who really see that way, not just for the sake of political correctness uh, or just words, social image and all that. No, they really see women like that. And that's their tendency. And so they treat women in a whole different way. A, whole, a much more egalitarian way, a much more equal way. So beyond that, the people in Vivartavada, the real sadhus, the people who are endeavoring for liberation, they see women as mother, as a spiritual mother, that all women have the tendency or the ability to nurture spiritually. And so they are deserving of respect, not just equals, but actually superior. We see this in real sadhus. Huh? Real sadhus are very respectful to women. They don't speak down to them. They don't speak to them as a buddy, huh? as a friend. They're always very respectful, a little distant. Huh? Because after all, you don't share everything with your mother. <laughs> there are certain parts of your life that are not appropriate to share with one's parents. So this is a very old uh, idea, but you know, I'm an old fashioned guy. What can I tell you? So this is very much correlated with real sadhus, people who are in the process of liberation. And finally, the self-realized people, the Ajatavadis, huh? they see women as goddess. This is because, as we discussed last time, consciousness is intrinsically feminine. Why? Because consciousness is simply the watcher, the observer, the witness. Huh? Consciousness is not the doer. Consciousness is not an agent. Consciousness has no initiative, no desires. Consciousness is simply watching the show. I had a dream last night, a long dream, about a, a, an adventure traveling with a group of people down this unfinished superhighway under construction wasn't open yet. Somehow or other, we were going down this road. And then we got to the end, and there was a big climax with the police and people shooting at each other. And we were just watching. We weren't involved. And at the end of the dream, we sat down with some of the people, some of the construction workers and people like that, and we were talking about, you know, the ending wasn't so great. Actually, if I was doing... <laughs> If I was writing this script, <laughs> it would have ended happier and, and this and that. We, we actually had this conversation. And then I woke up at 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but this is a kind of mood of consciousness. Consciousness is just sitting back, you know, eating popcorn and watching the movie. Consciousness is not involved. As soon as you get involved, as soon as you get identified with an identity, a persona, a body, a form, and the designations and possessions connected with that form, then this is not just consciousness anymore. This is mind. And mind is the source of the trouble. Mind is why we're suffering. Mind is why we take birth. So the self-realized person gets rid of mind, or at least, you know, keeps it very much under control and uh, doesn't let it run things, but uses it as a servant, like a computer. 
Hmm? That, ah, I want to know this or I want to see that. So this is the real use of the mind. When the mind takes over, oh boy, you're in trouble. Because it's going to drag you from one life to the next, from one body to another. And it will do that unlimitedly until it's brought under control by yoga. So the purpose of self-realization is to control the mind. And the method is called yoga, which means linking, yukta. Huh? Yoga, the word yoga comes from yukta. Yukta means to hook things up like a horse to a cart. So what are we doing? We're hooking up the individual soul with the super soul, the atma to the paramatma. And when we do this, we experience samadhi, nirvana. Okay, this amazing unlimited happiness that has no cause. So when we see this, when we see the real nature of consciousness, when we see that Tripura Sundari, who is pure awareness, awareness of awareness, she lives with Shiva even after the dissolution of the cosmic manifestation. She and Shiva are actually one. She's called Yogeshwari. It's one of her thousand names. Or even Maha Yogeshwari, because this yoga between her and Shiva is like none other. Because she and Shiva are co equal. But he is the passive partner, and she is the active partner. She is the personification of the desire that leads to the manifestation of the cosmos. So we uh, worship and investigate Tripura Sundari, the highest goddess, uh, because the male form or the male side of God is actually pretty easy to realize. <laughs> But the feminine side of God is much more difficult because she's active. She's manifest in an unlimited number of forms, names and forms and activities and so on. So there's no way that we can ever grasp her entirety by the mind. We have to transcend the mind and identify with Shiva and in the state of deep samadhi, then we can know who is Tripura Sundari. Aung Tatsat. Aung Harihi Aung.